mention things around regularity lemma and some of its applications. So, um, so this is a rough plan for today. Um, so first, I'll introduce what is the, so the background. <clears throat> so for the background part, I'll first introduce what is regularity lemma. And uh, I'll also introduce two proofs of the regularity lemma. Um, I think one proof uses the entropy argument, which is well known, and then the other one is the spectral proof, which is even less well known among graph theorists. Okay, and then, and then I'll talk about some applications of the regularity lemma on graphs. Okay, so it's, uh, for here I'll talk about um, counting lemma and. Uh, and the removal lemma, and some open questions around them, and then some of my work related to removal lemma. Okay, so so this is a rough plan. So let me start from the the background. Okay, so what is regularity lemma? So regularity lemma roughly says uh, for any g. Any graph G has a predictable uh, predictable structure, and the structure is very condensed. What it really means is um, so. So this is a very informal statement of the regularity lemma. Uh, a less informal uh, statement of the regularity lemma says for any G. The, um, we can partition its vertices into, bound, uh, into small number of parts such that. Maybe just to say, that often people call this semi-redis regularity. Oh, yes, yes, uh, I, sh I should say that. Uh, that's right. Um, right, okay, so I, ca I can say that. So Samaretti uh, introduced um, the regularity lemma in order to prove, um, um, in order to prove the Samaretti theorem, which says any dense subset of integers contains an arbitrarily long uh, arithmetic progression. So, so that's how he started this regularity lemma. And later people cleaned up his proof and then eventually find more and more applications of the regularity lemma. It became one of the most useful <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it becomes one of the deepest tools in uh, in modern graph theory. <laughs> it's important to know this. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, right. So, so it's one of the deepest and and and, um, and a famous and important tool in in modern graph theory. And uh, right. So, so this is a less informal uh, statement. It says for any g, there's a partition of its vertex set. Uh, Vg into a small number of parts such that uh, between almost all parts, uh, maybe I should start a new line. The edges distribute in a random like way. Well, yeah, uh, for uh, yeah, I, I so this is a less informal one. The, the formal one I'll introduce the epsilon. Okay, so yeah, this is for any g can we can partition its vertex into small number of parts. Um, so roughly, so when I say in, uh, partition into small number of parts, I mean so for any graph g, um, I can partition its vertex set into small number of parts. So those are the vertex sets, and then they are disjoint, and then they form the whole set. And then there are some edges distributed in a, across different parts, and then there are also edges within these, each of them. So some of the parts, the edges are dense, so I, I draw darker, darker across them. Some of them are sparser. 
so it's uh, so it's lighter. Okay. So what exactly does um, this statement mean? So I want to now I want to talk about the formal definition of this. So the formal definition, uh, the, the formal statement of the reg the Samaritis regularity lemma says for any epsilon. So the epsilon is going to be the the error parameter for the random like. Right. So this is the error parameter. Um, and then we can partition the vertex exactly as what we said. Is we can write the vertex set as a partition v1, v2, all the way to vm, where there are m parts in the partition, um, and uh, such into a small number of parts, uh, meaning m is bounded. So here's a small number. Means the number of parts is bounded by some constant m depending on epsilon. So for any epsilon, there exists an m such that I can write, huh, what's funny? Oh, it's just <laughs> 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 like a tower. Ah, you're ruining the suspense. <laughs> <laughs> OK, right, OK. So for any epsilon, there exists an m such that I can partition the vertex into m parts, where it's m bounded by the capital M. And uh, further, we can assume uh, all the vi's are roughly have the same size. So vi minus vj is more equal than 1. Can I, can I ask this? Yeah. So does the epsilon come after the choice of g or before the choice of g? Before the choice of g. Yeah, so it's the first line. Uh, OK, so for, for the first line, so let's start with there for any epsilon. And uh, there, yeah, there's an m such that for any g, I can write this. Um, OK, and between almost all pairs, I mean, uh, so this, this part, meaning uh, except at most epsilon m square pairs ij. So ij are the indices of the vertex sets. Um, the edges distributing a random like way. So here the random like, meaning uh, the pair vi vj uh, is epsilon regular, which I will define what is epsilon regular. OK. Right, so, so let me repeat the statement because it's kind of uh, looks a bit messy here. So for any epsilon, uh, so I fix an epsilon, which is a, a real number between 0 and 1. And for any graph G, no matter how, how large this graph is, I can always partition its vertex set into almost equal sizes, where the number of parts is bounded by a constant only depending on epsilon and independent from the number of vertices in G, um, such that uh, except a small fraction of uh, all the pairs vi, vj, um, the, all the edges across a typical pair vi, vj distributing a random-like way, which is measured by a notion called epsilon regular. Okay, so in, in this picture, it basically says, so I have g on n vertex, and then I tell you how much, um, how much uh, arrow you are allowed is epsilon, then I can always partition its vertex into v1, v2, all the way to vm, where m is bounded only by epsilon, independent from the size of the graph. And because each of the parts are kind of, uh, of equal sizes, so each part have roughly n divided by m vertices. And for a typical pair vi, vj, the address distribute uh, in a random like, which is called epsilon regular. So you're requiring that the parts have equal size, or roughly equal size? Yeah, roughly equal size, meaning vm minus vj is the most one, because that then is uh, useful to do lots of uh, an analysis. Yeah, do lots of counting, for example, because then I have lower bounds on this side of each part. OK, so what is epsilon regular? So here is the important definition. So for any bipartite, uh, so for any two parts, v i v j. So for now, I'm just using x y. Um, so suppose I have a bipartite graph on with two parts x and y. So here is x and y, and there are some edges across them. And so there's it's bipartite graph, so there's no edge uh, in in each side x and y. So all edges have one vertex in x and one vertex one vertex in y. So I say uh, this pair is epsilon regular. 
if for any uh, decent size subset x prime y prime y, the density between x prime y prime is not differ from the density of the whole set. So in particular, this is what I mean. Okay. So, did someone says okay. Oh yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I forgot. Um, I, I said that, but then I forgot to write it out. So when I say decent sizes, yeah, thank you. I mean x prime has size at least epsilon x, and then y prime has at least size epsilon y. So this is the scale. I'm allowed. Uh, I'm guaranteed. I'm guaranteed to make sure that it's distributing a random like way. Right, uh, so dxy, so here the notation dxy is the number of edges between x and y divided by their sizes. So it's uh, the edge density one normally assume. So for g, so for bipartite random graph with edge density p, so d is p. And then we know by uh, turn off bounds for, bipartite, for, for g and p, which is a bipartite graph, uh, yeah. And so this always holds. So that's what I mean is a uh, is, uh, is random like way. So basically for any x prime and y prime, I shouldn't expect it's going to be too dense or too sparse compared to the whole set. Uh, so in particular, what this means, it means, so this condition, uh, I guess, so this one. So this means if x, y is epsilon regular, then for any x prime and y prime, the number of edges, the number of edges across x prime, y prime, uh, subtracting what you expect between them. What, what do you expect is, um, is the total density of the whole graph multiply by their relative size. Yeah, thank you. Is at most epsilon uh, x y. So this is a um, easy uh, implication of of uh, of this definition. No, this is x y x times y. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure what whether it has a name. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I want to write it for every x prime and y prime. Yeah, so here I want to drop the condition that each of them have decent size. Okay, right. So when? Uh, oh, okay. Uh, so let, let's see how to get this from this. So um, to proof. So if um, x prime say is smaller or equal than x epsilon. So, okay. So if both of them are greater. Then by the definition, if I multiply x prime, y prime on both sides, I have the same condition with a stronger bound. Uh, so if x and y prime are, are kind, kind of big, then I have this bound, which is better than this bound. And on the other hand, if uh, one of them is large, say, uh, is too small, um, then e x prime y prime is at most x prime times y prime, which is at most epsilon x times y y prime, because x prime is too small. So this got absorbed in, into, the, into the error bound. So it absorbs the error bound. Yeah, um, right, so the minor thing, this is still very small because this is most epsilon, epsilon some fraction. So, okay, so maybe I should change this to maybe a constant times epsilon. Uh, okay. Well, there's two things I don't understand. First of all, how to prove it, and secondly, how it is useful and what does it mean? Yeah. Because it's not clear to me what it means. Oh, okay. Um, so let, let me finish proving this. Okay, um, and then what I have from here is, um, E x prime y prime. So let me 
is smaller or equal than d times is smaller or equal than this. And then I can absorb d. So if I write dxy times x times y, x prime y prime, then I can subtract this. OK, um, so I basically, so I want to observe this part inside this part. And for the second part, so this is at most So for the second part, d is, uh, is at least 0, because it's positive, so it's at most epsilon xy. So what? Oh, because this is how a, do you how do you oh, because non-negative, so I just uh, copy everything down. Okay. Yeah. Right. So, so this part is easy, easy. And then for the other side, um, so I want, to, I want to find a lower bound for this. Uh, the xy. So notice this is at least minus the xy times x prime y prime. And this is at least minus uh, epsilon x. So because d is at most 1, and then x prime is at most epsilon times x times y. So, so if you write down those inequalities carefully, and by just using d is at most one is at least zero, and because x prime is too small, it got absorbed. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Right. So it's useful when you are doing, for example, doing the counting, which I'll show maybe later. This is so. This implies this. Yeah. So yeah, this is weaker than this. I mean, for it's smaller sets, it's a bad. It's, it's a yeah, yeah. So you're right. So for smaller sets, this is not very useful. But then it's kind of a unifor unified form to to bound number of edges across two parts. Yeah. There is a worse implication if you assume better parameters. Like if you assume epsilon cube there, I think you get epsilon in the original or something like that. Uh, which epsilon? Yeah, yeah in, in there, in, in the homology. Yeah. You assume you epsilon, epsilon cube or something, and you get epsilon back here. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, they, they, yeah, they're, they're all okay. So it's because in usual, in usual uh, applications, we is, is if it's a change to a polynomial of epsilon, it doesing really matter too much. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Which will come up. Uh, I'll show you later. <laughs> you, you you'll come up it's pretty soon. Okay, you, you love that multiple places. It's hard, but it's hard. Well, but it's also necessary. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, which right, right. So depends mm -hmm. on how much you know, like what the degree of the polynomial will be for that condition. Good. All these questions and more will be answered in the next couple of lectures. So. No, like, like, no, I know for the normal regular level. OK, so now I'll talk about two proofs of the regularity lemma. One of them uh, is, uh, pretty typical, is pretty common. And then the other one, the other one I think is, is a very nice, cute proof. Um, it's, a, it's a spectral proof. So I'll first talk about the, the typical proof by using entropy arguments. And then you, your question, uh, the answer to your question will come up from, from the proof. You'll see. Okay. Right. Uh, OK, so now so proof one. Of regularity lemma, of Samaradi's regularity lemma. Okay, so proof. Um, 
So this, uh, so okay, so in in also in the later parts of the talk, I'll I'll talk about regularity type of proof by saying I keep on partitioning the, so I keep on refining my partition step by step. So this is what I mean, and this is basically what this proof is doing. So I start, um, so it basically says um, for any partition, so for any partition P and Q, where Q refines P, which I mean is, so suppose I have a partition P with V1, V2, V3, V4, this is just an example. And one Q partition P is, each part of Q lies entirely in one part of, uh, of P. So something like this. So this is, uh, so the smaller ones are the parts in Q. So the general speaking, you can say that the exactly. some keep track of the entropy. Some potential function of the real entropy. Yes, that's right. Some yeah, so some potential function. Yeah, maybe I should say potential function because later there are variants of those functions which, uh, which serve different purposes. So we have some potential function and it keeps... Keep tracking how... Decreases or increases? Uh, depends on your potential function. So uh, what are you going to do? Yeah, I'm going to make it increase. Increase. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. So where, so where does um, this comes in? Okay. Let's see. Okay, there it is. So for any, so okay, so here is uh, how I'm going to define the potential function. Okay, so first of all, for two pairs, Q, A, B. The potential function is defined for a single partition, not for a pair of partitions. Yeah, so it's for the whole partition. We're, we're fixing now some big partition Q. That's right. And now you're defining the potential function by looking at Adding up. Which are two parts. Yeah, so two subsets. Mm -hmm. okay. And then I, so I define a function between two, two parts in the partition A and B, and I add everything up. Yeah. So that's my potential function. But, uh, maybe I should say, so for any, um, so given partition, so for any A, B, and P, and similar for in Q, so if it's two parts, then I, so A and B are two vertex subsets. Um, so let me say, this whole big part is A and this, uh, I'll change it. So this is A and this is B. And it has some density DAB in between. And uh, I, okay, so throughout the, the process, I only care about the edges across two parts. So I kind of ignore the edges inside A and B. Right, so DAB only measures how many, uh, the density of edges across A and B. So QAB, I define it to be one over, ah, okay, so suppose, uh, uh, right, so, so suppose G has n, vert n vertices. So uh, let me do the normalization here, so it's easier. But typically you don't have to um, worry too much about normalization, it's just it's D A B square times A B. Um, right. Yeah, it's number of vertices. No, and, and. Uh, and it's number of vertices in G. Okay. Right, so, and yeah, the whole graph has n vertices, and then I have two vertex subsets A and B, and I keep track of the, um, the entropy of the edges across A and B. And then. Why would you call it entropy, though? Like, there are a lot of uh, right? Okay, okay, let me call it, right, okay. There, there are other papers which, which actually really use the entropy, but here, let me call it for potential functional energy. Okay, and Q, A, and B, uh, Q and P is simply adding up all the, all the A and Bs. So it's a, uh, it's a partition of O, A, B. And they are disjoint, uh, times P, and times uh, Q, A, B. Okay, um, right, so for now, you just need to cons ah. Okay, so here's the, here's the remark. Um, so what is this potential or energy function is doing? You, can, you should treat it as, um, if I put the normalization here, then this is really doing the L2 norm of the edges 
it's, it's kind of uh, it's kind of the L two L two norm of the edges uh, with respect to this partition. L two square. L two square. Yes. Thank you. Um, right. So why is um, okay? So so first of all, why this is useful? So this potential function has some properties. So the first one is very important is that um, this is a monotone, meaning if Q refines P, uh, meaning the parts of Q are smaller than parts of P, and every part of Q lies in parts of P, then QP is smaller than QQ. So um, in the process of keep on refining my partition, the entropy function, uh, the potential function keeps on increasing. So, so can you define this refinement? Sorry, where, where? What, what do you mean by Q refines P? Ah, okay, so it's kind of like this picture. So, so if I have P, which is four big sets, say, and then Q refines P is, I, I cut each part of P into smaller parts. Okay. So I'm cut, and so each part of Q lies entirely in one part of P. In some parts of P. By the way, are we summing the over all the pairs that are different? A different from B? Uh, it, it doesn't matter because it's only it's only the diag diagonal one. So, so let, let me do this first. Yes, right. It doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So this is what we uh, yeah. So this is the monotonicity. Monotone. Um, is, is, yeah, I'm skipping this by, by just looking. If you look at the L2, L2 square norm, then you can see it's, it's increasing it's by, right. by convexity, yeah. for example. Yeah. 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 Should, I, should I write this or is it okay? Yeah, so this is by convexity. Okay. And so, in, so we know throughout the process of partitioning, partitioning the graph, the, the potential function always increases. But it's going to be useless if uh, the potential function can be arbitrarily large. So I also want the potential function to be bounded. Uh, and that's easy, uh, because uh, for any partition p, so first of all, it's easy to see is that it's non-negative. It's, non it's at least 0. And also, this is at most 1. Because what this does is, um, so for QAB, this is at most the number of edges. So if I remove the 2, uh, the square here, then it's at most the number of edges across A and B divided by n squared. And then if I sum up all pairs A and B, this is at most the number of total number of edges in G divided by n squared, which is at most 1, or even a half. Right. So this is because um, QAB is at most number of edges in A and B divided by n squared. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, right. So for A and, A and B are the same. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> right. So so maybe, so you, so one is actually correct here, yeah. since we are doing the order set. Okay. Right. So we know now the entropy function is always increasing and is bounded in the interval zero and one. But then I I want to make sure the procedure ended in finite number of steps where the number of steps is independent from the number of vertices. So I. So I want to make sure um, if my graph is, I'm now happy with my partition, I can always increase my potential function by a lot. So here is uh, the following lemma. Okay. So if so, for any two vertex subsets A and B, if A B is not epsilon regular, then um, then Q A B. Ah. So if A and B is not epsilon regular, it means from the definition of a pair being epsilon regular, I, uh, where's the definition? Oh, here. Yeah, from the definition of a pair being epsilon regular, I can find A prime of decent size in A and B prime of different uh, distant, uh, decent sizes in B such that The density between A prime and B prime differ from what we accept by A quite a lot. Okay, and then 
And then we can do the following. So if a and b are the two parts, and this is my a prime, yeah, let me draw it in the bottom. So it's a, so this part is a prime, and this prime part is b prime. Okay, and uh, a prime has size at least epsilon and of the fraction, and b prime is epsilon. And so let let me, so I, let me slightly uh, uh, abuse the notation by treating a and b have n vertices each. It doesn't matter because later on we will normalize everything. And uh, what do we have here? So, so, so the, the whole graph has edge density d. And uh, a prime, d prime, let's say that the density is um, this may be d11. And I have uh, uh, three other cross parts. So let me call this uh, a prime, uh, a double prime and b double prime for the rest of the parts. And then, so d11 is the density between a, and a prime and b prime. d22 is the density between a double prime and b double prime. And d12 is the density between a double prime and b prime. Uh, the same for the others. Uh, a prime, b double prime. OK, so those are all the, f so uh, now I partition a and b into, f into four parts in total. A prime, A double prime, B prime, B double prime. And I want to show um, the entropy increases by a lot by doing this refinement. Um, so how, what's notation I'm using? OK, well, let me use the notation. So I want to claim uh, Q. Um, um, hmm. Let me call it P prime for the parts after I cut into four pieces. and, and Yeah, maybe let me let me write one a one and a two. Yeah, that's a good point. That's right. Okay, so that I don't have to write all of four of them. Yes, that's right. Um, okay, so so a one and b one are the witnesses for the for violating the epsilon regular. Ah, okay, so so I so you know the prime is one and double prime is two. Right okay, um, so a one, a two, a. Th so let me slightly uh, abuse the notation to denote the new partition I have. So I want to say this um, changes by at least epsilon to the fourth times the correct normalization. Okay, so here is a because here I'm using n as a different thing. But, uh, let me. Okay, we can fix the normalization later. So the important part is that um, we increase epsilon to the fourth of the fraction of total uh, the possible number of edges between n and b. So why this is the case? So first of all, um, because we know d a one. Okay, so what do we know here? So so one thing to note is that. Um, which also impose some limitations of the regular dilemma for sparse graphs, is that this condition is really, really already guarantees you some certain densities across the parts A and B. So why is that? Um, because here, so if um, the, so the extreme cases are, um, so if the A1, B1 is at least epsilon, so this is the one extreme when DAB is zero, uh, you, so you know this is at least epsilon, then the number of edges, then the density DAB is at least um, epsilon, uh, is, is at least um, the total number of edges across A and B, which is at least the number of edges across A prime and B prime, uh, divided by A times B. And this is at least epsilon A prime B prime divided by a and b. OK, so here comes the part where I require a prime b prime to be at least some constant fraction. So each of them is at least epsilon fraction of a, so this is at least epsilon cube. And then you can do the other direction. So, um, so if this is smaller, so, so, so the first one is if this is bigger than this one, then I have the a1b1 the a is at least epsilon, then I have this condition. 
And for the other direction, if DAB is larger, then I know DAB is already greater than epsilon. Right. So, so, this, um, so the pair AB is not being epsilon regular already kind of tells you the density across A and B is some constant depending on epsilon. So meaning this, this, const, uh, th this density cannot go to, go to zero as n goes to infinity if I fix epsilon as some small constant. Okay, so we will see this coming up later. Right, um, right. So, so now let me try to prove the, uh, prove the claim. So how, how to prove it? Oh, okay, it's basically by, you can call it uh, local adjustment or, or, other, or but simply by convexity. Um, so the, the worst situation, okay, so the worst situation you can have to make the in increment as small as possible. So the only condition we have is uh, we only need to make sure this one holds to make the increment, the potential increment smaller, potential small. Okay, so the, 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 the most awful thing we can do is, um, is say A1 is basically epsilon times A, and B1 is epsilon times B. Let me call it proof sketch, because it can be made formal later. Um, right, so the bigger the A is, the, the, the more potential increment I can have, because if A1 and B1 are just empty, then I don't gain anything. So I want A1 and B1 to be as small as possible so they, they reach this gap. And then I also, so the more uniform the edges distribute, the potential increases the less. So I also want, just want D11 minus D to be exactly epsilon. Okay, now, now it comes come down to algebra. So you can, you can just simply writing down the, the definitions of the potential functions, so say uh, if, so the first case is if d11 minus d is epsilon, then if you write down everything, you, we can see it's, it's the worst if we make um, d as small. Uh, okay, so if you write down everything is uh, basically d11 times epsilon square, because I have epsilon square here, and then, and then plus uh, d12 times epsilon. Okay, if you think this part is boring, let me know, then I'll start. Stop writing this. Epsilon. Okay, and then the condition on d1, d1, 2, d2, 1, this is square. Oh, is that the total number of edges of the other three parts add up uh, plus d11 times epsilon square is the total number of edges across, which is d. And uh, the best thing you can do is to make d1, 2, d2, 1, d2, 2 uh, as equal. And so this is uh, basically d1, 1 squared times epsilon squared. And then, oh, where's my computation? Um, okay, and then you, if you do the computation, you can see for the rest of parts, the total number of edges is d minus uh, d1, 1 times epsilon squared and divided by uh, 1 minus epsilon squared. And so this is the value of the rest of d12, d21, d22 if they are equal. Right, so because this part counts the number of edges remaining and then this is a uh, total number of square, base. Right? Yeah, this is square. And then square here. Yeah, and then times uh, whatever those things are, which is one minus epsilon square. And then by using the fact that I think the D is at least epsilon cube. Um, you can you can see this uh, is at least epsilon to the fourth. So I already dropped all the normalization a times b. So yeah. So this times a times b is the entropy increment. Yep. So this two over here, you can replace them with any real bigger than one, or you know, q would equal d b squared times. Wait, wait, which part? Yeah, 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 any two, any value of two bigger than one will be fine, right? Or do you ever attribute the two? Any any value bigger like, than you, one? You know, if you wrote oh, this two? two? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can, you can always any, do any that. Any guy bigger than one. Right, right, right. Is yeah. Cool is two yeah. actually the correct thing? Like, if you want the tower of twos to have a small degree or whatever, you know, two is actually the correct thing to put there. Yeah, and then 
That's right. So if you, you, you put it like a sharper and sharper, then it favors like a more increment. So you'll get weaker results. That's Wait, why you have better you bounds. Wait, is two correct though? No, no you, get, you, go, you definitely get a tower two as a type of polymorph epsilon. I'm asking about the degree of the polymorph epsilon. You yeah, you can, you can work out the, the computation. Can you actually and then minimize the degree of that tower? I don't think so. Okay. Probably not. So yeah. What's the correct? Do you know? I don't okay. know. You you do the. <laughs> <laughs> you yourself. Yeah. And a very like, good question. Um, so I think there is a paper by Rebecca Rizan who looked at this proof as an application of mirror descent, and then it, uh, he messes with the uh, regularizers. Do you have any? Uh, do you know this paper? And. Uh, oh, which paper is that? <laughs> I don't recall the name, but I think it's by Luca Rizan. Okay. It looked like a, a test proof as uh, regret minimization. As a regret mean online optimization. Online optimization. I mean, I mean um, it's, it's not. Yeah. I don't understand why you're laughing. There is an optimization going on here. You define some optimization function is true or something. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because you use the phrase mirror descent. No, no, but it's. Yeah, yeah, I'm not laughing. No, <laughs> this guy okay. is laughing. And uh, <laughs> I'm not commenting to your comment. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm not uh, quite aware of the paper you mentioned. Maybe you can talk about yes. uh, offline. Yeah. But then this type of uh, idea has appeared in, in so many applications. And, and then it gives different variants of the regular dilemma, for example. And then some of them can be made algorithmic, algorithmic and for different graphs, too. The, the claim in the uh, Kelly part that like K what is Ah, so, so, so he, I'm slightly abusing the notation. So here, what I mean is, so if you partition A and B into four parts, now you have a newer partition refining the original A and B, uh, then the entropy, the, the potential function increases by quite a lot. So also this so, okay. calculation is ignoring the contribution between inside A and inside Exactly, yeah. yes, cool. right. OK, um, now why? Uh, maybe. Okay, uh, so now hopefully we can already kind of see why this part comes in and why certain uh, conditions is, is explicitly epsilon m square pairs of uh, ij has to violate the epsilon regular uh, is, is relevant. So this is because, um, so now I'm just writing it informally. Can, can everybody see, see here? Okay, so if so if I'm not happy with a partition, so if I'm not happy with P, with my current partition P, um, then it means I have so many of such pairs A and B. So I have uh, at least epsilon P square bad pairs, oh, pairs A and B, such that um, such that the claim holds. Claim holds? Great. Um, and because of the normalization, so I know the total increment. Just to understand where we're going. So we proved properties one, two, and three. Right. Um, still it hasn't given you the whole thing yet because. Yeah, the whole thing because. Right. Yeah. So now you're going to show uh, so us I'm how going we to converge or how we. Yeah, how we use one, two, and three in total to prove uh, to, to prove regular dilemma. That, yeah, okay. Okay. So what does it mean not happy with P? Ah, so it means uh, I'm, I'm not done with this um, this partition yet. So it means I have at least epsilon. Yeah, non epsilon regular pairs. Right. Yeah. So why why this is true? Because um, so this also com comes into the play with normalization. If among all the partitions I only have one pair A and B, that is not epsilon regular. Then, because of the increment, I only get, if I normalize by the total number of, ad, of vertices in, in the graph, then I, the, the total increment I get is only epsilon to the four. Okay. So let me write if only one pair, Vivj in P, is not abs uh, that is not epsilon regular, then the entropy increment, then potential increment. What I can guarantee is only at least epsilon to the fourth times Vivj divided by n squared. But then, but then this is not so great. Oh, okay. So by the way, in each time when I when I do the 
refinement, I can continue cut this to make sure all of them have roughly the same size. So I'm ignoring that part here. Yeah. OK, so, so what this means is if Vn and Vj, but Vn and Vj has the size roughly n divided by the size of p. So this is only epsilon to the fourth um, times, uh, times uh, m to the square. Uh, no, not m, the p square. But then the p is, is too large. p grows very fast. Then I, I don't really get a very nice increment in the potential. So that's why I require, but if I have so many pairs, if uh, at yeah, least. Yeah, so you know, before I stop, so P is the num so it's the M in, in some step. And then when it eventually stops, I have some M. Right. So, so this is the M in, in the middle. But if at least epsilon P square pairs are bad, uh, pairs are not epsilon regular, then I have the increment is at least this thing, epsilon to the fourth, where I p square multiply by epsilon p square. Because this is the number of pairs I know that violates. And then this is epsilon to the fifth. So I have a real, uh, I, I really have a constant that is uniform throughout the step uh, to, to make the potential function incre increase. So here is a proof of regular dilemma. OK. So now, so let me call this uh, property 4. Um, so that if p is not a rec uh, it's not a epsilon regular partition in the sense in the statement, then we can find refinement q of p such that the potential increment is at least epsilon to the fifth. So just confirming, in the claim, should there have been an n squared at the denominator of the right-hand side? Yeah, so uh, here I'm uh, also kind of uh, Ignoring the, okay. the normalization here, yeah. But, but everything should be normalized eventually by the total number of edge, uh, vertices squared. Yeah. So, so this is the main part. There should be something about the size of P. Yeah, uh, so I haven't, I haven't gone into that part yet. Right, so yeah, it's, it's, it's the next sentence. Yeah, thank you for reminding me. That's the next sentence I should say about. Um, Okay. Um, okay. So maybe I'll say that sentence after the, the next, the real next sentence. Okay. So the entropy function is always increasing, and it's between zero and one. So I keep on doing this refinement steps. The number of steps. So keep on refining. The number of steps before stopping. Is at most. 1 over epsilon to the fifth. So it shows actually the procedure have to stop in finite number of steps, and then the finite number only depends on epsilon. OK. And then now it comes to the size of, of Q and of uh, your question of how big the size is. OK, now let's look how big is Q compared to P. So given Q, um, oh, sorry, given, given P, so now here's my P. So it has, say, uh, p parts. So for each pair, a and b, potentially I'll, I'll cut them into two parts for each of them. And then, and then so, so this is between v1 and v2. And between v1 and v3, I potentially also cut. So I, I add another cut here. So in each step, when I do the cutting, I, I double the number of parts here. Right. So this means um, Q is at most. So for each part in P, the number of parts I cut is at most 2 to the uh, size of P. But they're not equally, they're not equally sized. Yeah, this is, that's a good point. Um, so now I have, say, this many of, of, of parts. 
And what I can do is uh, I, OK, so, so suppose this is my constant um, uh, notation. Suppose this is my constant, um, I call, call it n naught. Uh, so n naught parts. OK, but in, in this part, in this pair, n naught is, is, is this number. Uh, this is n naught. OK, so now I want to make sure every part is equal size. And um, if it's n naught parts, then each, uh, then in, in average, each part has size uh, n divided by n naught. Right. But then they, they, they can differ by sizes by quite a lot. So what I can do is I, I further cut them so that, so cut each part as, as, um, as much as possible so that each part, each, each smaller part, has size uh, epsilon n divided by n naught. I can do this. So if one part, um, so this is p, one part in p, and then this, suppose this is what I get after q. So this is, a, this is one refinement of one part of p. And what I can do is um, I cut them into equally spaces pieces for each part of them. But then there might, for each part, there might be some left over here that has size smaller than this. And then what I can do, I, ca I can just collect all of them. But then they are very small. So in total, I only collect, maybe if I do epsilon squared, I only have epsilon squared number of vertices that got thrown into garbage. But it doesn't really matter. It's still a refinement, and then all the properties still hold. It's even better. Right. OK, so, so this means um, this is, uh, I get q is at most this divided by epsilon squared. Doesn't matter. OK. And I know we uh, repeat, if you, if you iterate this function 1 over epsilon to the fifth times, so it means when we stop, m epsilon is at most some power of 2 of size uh, 1 over epsilon to the fifth, some constant. So this is like 2 to the 2 to the 2. And then the size is <coughs> some poly polynomial in 1 over epsilon to the fifth. Right, so back to your question. If epsilon is 0 0.5, uh, 0 0.1, uh, I think this is already larger than the number of atoms in the universe. So, yeah. So it's some theoretical results. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Right, so this is, um, OK, but then there are some other variants of the regularity lemma may maybe you will like, because that gives you not as strong as this condition, but, it's, but it guarantees you the counting in the global sense. And then the bound is much better. It's only exponential. So in that, in, so for, it's called weak regularity lemma. I'll talk about it next week. Yeah. yeah. Oh, why is oh because if I know this uh, this condition is violated, I know there are too many parts v and v j that are not epsilon regular, okay. and if it's not epsilon regular, then by the definition of uh, epsilon reg by the definition of epsilon regular, I can f there must exist such a set x prime and y prime, okay. and then and then that's how I cut the first v and v j, and then for another v j prime, I, I continue cutting it. Okay. So yeah. yeah. Yes. And you say, if there is a number, then this must be a Okay. Right. OK. Um, time is it now? You want to take a break? Yeah, sure. Oh, yeah. Is it a good time for you? Yes, it's a good time. Okay. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> OK. Uh, <laughs> should I start? Please oh. do. Yeah. OK, so we, we see the, the proof of the regularity. The, the first proof of the regularity lemma is to keep on partitioning if you find too many not regular parts. And you get such a bound. So in fact, 
<coughs> this bond is awful, as, as we see. But then, unfortunately, this bond is tight uh, in the sense that uh, Gawa's proof um, there exists a graph such that O regular partition is of this tower type of, of, uh, of height polynomial in 1 over epsilon. And then it's by Gauss. And then his proof is basically by reverse engineering this whole, whole, whole procedure. So you start from a nice graph. And then, so OK, I'm just going to give two sentences about how, how this proof roughly goes. So suppose you have two parts. And then, so what is, what is bad about this partition? So maybe you have density 1 and 1 in the two parallel parts. But then for the, for the diagonal ones, you only have 0 and 0. So this means you have to cut this graph into two parts. OK, now you have two parts. And now I have only guaranteed you, oh, maybe I shouldn't say one. It's just some large number, say epsilon. Now I have two parts. I only tell you the edge densities across them. If I have to continue cutting them, I have to keep on doing the same thing, make I just distribute in a very not uniform way. And then so you can continue doing this step. And that, that's, how, that's what I call the reverse engineering. And then you can prove this bound is tight. OK. Um, maybe just with 1 over epsilon. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, I think the, um, he's, uh, right, I think that the current state of art is maybe epsilon to the maybe three. I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. I, yeah. So Jacob and, uh, yeah, and Lowe lower was lower round. I think they, they proved some, uh, some polynomial one epsilon. But I, I don't remember exactly what that polynomial degree is. Yeah. OK. Um, so this proof, this type of proof uh, appears very common in lots of places. Um, in, in modern graph theory when you're trying to prove, uh, especially, especially when you try to embed a small graph into a large graph and you want to count the number of small graphs. So th this appears a lot. Um, there's a, another proof of the regularity lemma, which is of algebraic flavor. It looks very different from this one. But I think um, the other proof is, um, is, is, you can visualize that better than, than this proof. OK, so, so this appears on, on Terence Tell's block. So uh, I call it proof two. Um, it's called the spectral proof. Terence Tau. Right. OK. Um, right. So, so, so we have a big graph G now. And then um, what we do, we do is um, we look at this adjacency matrix. So it's adjacency matrix. I may call it T for now. Um, and we all know it has the eigen decomposition, so I can write uh, oh, so G on n vertices. So it's a adjacency matrix of n by n. <coughs> so T is an n by n matrix. And uh, if I do the eigen decomposition, I can have is of this form. So i goes to from 1 to n, where lambda i are the eigenvalues, uh, which I assume lambda 1, at least lambda 2, they are all real values. Sums of n. And uh, ui's are the orthonormal basis. OK. Right. So this is the setup. And then now I, I want to basically, OK, so what is uh, this, the condition of counting the number of edges across two subsets? Uh, so here's some notes. So if A and B are in V, if they are distinct, then the number of edges between A and B, you can write it as uh, indicator function A. So you consider this as um, a 1 by n for, uh, vector where you have ones if, uh, if the vertex v is in a, and 0 otherwise. So you have such a matrix, and then times uh, t times 1 v. Yeah, so if you write down the matrix exactly, then you can see this constant number of edges across a and b. Um, right, and also this, this, form, uh, this form also makes it harder if the graph is a hypergraph versus a graph. So this is a, it's a quick side note. Um, Sorry, what is that? What did you say about diagonal? Huh? Diagonal? What did you say about hypergraph? Oh, I, 
Okay, maybe I should say that later after after this, so it <laughs> makes makes more sense. So I'm just trying to say there's a very clean form uh, to estimate the number of atoms between A and B uh, for a graph because you can use a spectral norm of T to approximate number of edges. But for hypergraph, it's, it's, it's less clear what choice you should have. Okay. Right. Okay. So now now we have this set up. Oh yeah, yeah, star is uh, transform. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, T is the adjacent matrix. Yeah. T is symmetric. It's symmetric. We're not doing it for arbitrary. Yeah, it's the adjacent matrix of G. G is a simple graph. I also think you mean UI UI star. Uh, yes. <laughs> That's right. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so UI is uh, so UI is uh, is uh, the the standing one, and then this one is also the standing one. Yeah, okay. Um, where are we? Yeah. So I so T throughout the proof is adjacent to matrix of G, because I want to use A for for vertex sets. <coughs> okay. And uh, a simple fact is the trace of T square, uh, as we all know, um, is going to be the number of add is going to. Hmm? Oh, sorry. Okay. Is, um, is summation by definition. And this is going to be the twice number of edges in G by plugging A and B to be the whole set. So, so this is definition of the trace squared. And uh, oh, it's not the definition, but it is, it's an easy consequence of this. I hope it's OK for everyone. OK, and then the point for this is this as most n squared. Okay. Uh, right, each number of edges in G, and if you plug in V, uh, V here, V and V here, uh, so this it, okay. So it's counting the number of uh, two cycles, which is the uh, number of yeah. So it's uh, edges. And yeah, you can okay. You can see it also just like you said by plugging in the vectors, mm -hmm. and you can also see it as closed work. Right. Yes, yes, that's right. Yeah, right. There, there are lots of yeah. So I, I want to get this one first. Okay, and because uh, I have this, uh, so I already ordered uh, lambda i's in this way. So I know uh, for each i, uh, lambda i is at most uh, n divided by square root of i. Okay, so this is a simple fact. Okay. All right. So now, oh, oh, uh, because lambda i squared is at most uh, n squared. And then lambda is the, the ith largest. So, um, so summation lambda i squared um, is, so n squared is at least this. And this is at least i times lambda i squared, because I already ordered them. I, I drop all the, all the tails. And then for each, each of the lambda i before lambda, each, for each of lambda j before lambda i is at most, is that? Uh, wait, uh, let me see. Uh, did I miss something? <coughs> yeah, I think oh, for lambda. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. So for each of the front one is uh, is at least lambda i. Yeah. So I have this bound. Okay. Okay. Now, now I'll come into some iteration. Okay. So let so let f be a function into a, from integers to integers, and I assume it's monotonally increasing. And suppose f i greater or equal than i, which we'll see why why this condition comes in soon. Okay. So for any such a function, what we can do is okay. So let me first uh, write down a statement. So claim. There exists an i such that, or there exists an j such that summation right. So basically, this is saying for any, so I can always find an interval 
where the summation of lambda i squared is arbitrarily small. So it doesn't have to be epsilon cubed. Here it's sufficient to choose epsilon cubed. So why this is the case? So because, um, so this is my f. It's i and f i. And what this is that? So, so I first start with f up, f one, and um, so one. So oh, this interval. So if I add from f, um, so lambda one squared plus all the way to f one squared, it gives me some sum of the summation lambda i squared. So, so here for simplicity, I just assume. Sorry, yeah. I'm not, I'm not following what's going on. The claim says, what's the claim? Oh, this is a claim. This is a claim. For any monotonic Right. There exists some, j, j is what, an integer? Or a yeah, it's, it's an integer. Uh, in, uh, it's an integer. So j small equal than n. Right, so, so basically I'm saying I can find an interval in the lambda i's mm -hmm. such that, so I find a set of them so that the, the total sum of square is almost this way. So you can, you can prove this by convergence, or you can. J is at most little n. Yeah, so j is an index from 1 to n. And f, fj is also an index. Right. Uh, so here you can, OK, maybe I should say as the minimum of fj and n. That's what I mean. OK, so we, we can see this um, So from f1 to 1, and then you can again doing the same thing, and then I can start from so if this this is i equals f i, and I can go from f one to f f one, and then so these indices add up, uh, so you keep on doing the stuff, so you keep on iterating f, I continue chopping um, the interval zero to n to a bunch of intervals because. The total sum of lambda square is bounded. One of the intervals has to be small. So that's what it says. You do yeah, these intervals. Where does epsilon come from? Oh, epsilon is uh, is epsilon in the in the regular lemma. Can you explain the proof again? Oh, okay. Uh, so what is the proof? So we have a we have a graph. We have a function. Okay, maybe we'll suddenly we have some boundary. Right. Uh, sorry, well, where should I? So what's the, what's the def, what's this claim again? Like so I, the claim is there's an index j, okay. maybe it's 5, such that maybe fj is 10, so that uh, lambda 5 squared plus lambda 6 squared all the way to plus lambda 10 squared is at most uh, this value. Is that most this one? Okay, so what's the proof? So let's uh, let's cut the interval zero to n into the following. So I have one f one, uh, f one plus one, all the way to f f uh, one plus one, and then I have uh, I have f of uh, this value one plus one, and then f of uh, the previous one. So I keep on having those uh, those intervals, and they are all disjoint, and then they cover all the indices. And so those are indices of the lambda i's. And uh, if so, for each of the interval, I can I can compute the summation of lambda i. So if this is i one, the i is in i one. And then similarly, I have I can compute the sum of intervals for each of them. And if I continue doing this, then because the total sum of uh, those lambda i's at most n squared, and then those are those are the partition of all the lambda, all the, in, all, the, all the indices. So I know one of them must be small by, by pigeonhole. How can this be true though? Because if f if f of one is n, then yeah, this should be some quantifier like forever. Yeah. Then I just <laughs> I just choose. Uh, But if, uh, yeah, then, then you just have uh, lambda n square, and that's OK. That's big J as well. Oh, I see. Yeah. Right. Oh, so, so he was asking me, what if uh, f1, f1 is, uh, is just n? Yeah. Uh, 
uh, and I just say you can just choose lambda n. So you just pick j to be n. Yeah, so you're basically only saying lambda n squared is at most epsilon n, epsilon square n, uh, epsilon cube n square n. And so regarding Robert's point, like, why doesn't that already imply the claim? Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> why? Because because what this is actually saying is something stronger. Like, you want to say for every interval width, there is a there is an index such that if I start there, then that yes. like, some. Okay. Right. So for any f, yeah, yeah. I can I can have this. I mean, you can say there's at most any f, but the f kind of makes it. Like oh, okay, okay. So, so maybe, maybe let me say that. So, to prove this, I just choose f i to be i. Okay. okay. So, just, just assume f i equals i. I can prove this one. Um, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, let me see. It was, uh, I think I wrote it down. Um, right. And then, and then if I Yeah, this is true for any function f. Okay, so then you can actually find out, like, uh, you can actually bound lambda to the because it bounds the sum of. Yeah, yeah. So, so for this one, I'm not saying it applies this one or the other way around. Does this give anything better than this? No. This is stronger. Okay, so what is, so the, the, what is the conclusion quantified? I don't know, yeah. What do you mean by large and small? So you have many, you know, one of them must be small. But where does epsilon come in? Uh, OK, so what will come later is I'm going to chop t. I'm going to decompose t based on whether it's inside this interval. So one part, OK, maybe let me write down this. So I can write down t equals to t1 plus t2 plus t3. And T1 is the part, um, is the summation of lambda i ui ui squared, where i is smaller than j. And T2 is the part um, where i is in inside this interval. And then T3 is the part that comes later. OK, so the point is that uh, T1 is the, um, you, can, you can imagine that as the structured part of my graph. So it roughly gives you what the final partition is. And then T2 is the small, um, T2, the small oscillations. And T3 is kind of the very small pseudo random parts because the summation of them is, yeah. So you'll see that later. OK. Mm. OK, so. so, so Right. Um, the epsilon fits into the claim is because uh, so later on we'll use a spectral spectrum uh, spectral norm to to bound to bound this guy. So if I know t has spectral form smaller than epsilon, so for example. Oh, where does it fit into the the proof of the claim? Oh, yeah. Okay. So by pigeonhole, at most uh, at most I iterate one over epsilon cube steps. So I have at most one over. Okay, so I know what I want all the way to i one over epsilon cube. If I can go this far, then I must have an interval. So this gives me a bound on uh, how many how many rounds of iteration I have on, on f. Can you repeat that? Right. Um, so what I'm either I go one over epsilon times or I go less than that. Yeah. So so I first have i one, and if it's already smaller than this, I'm done. And if it's greater than, than this, I go to i2. And then if it's smaller, then I'm done. And if it's not, I continue to go to i3. So I'm saying like we can go at most 1 over epsilon square steps before we find such an, uh, find such a, such an interval. So are you also getting the claim that j is at most 1 over epsilon cube or something like that? Yeah, so j is at most, I iterate f at most 1 over epsilon square steps. So this, this, uh, this so is the claim. That's not a question. Hmm? No, Right, but then and f of j minus j minus c. That's right. Uh, so so eventually the j the j will play in the play in the so this so the j will play in the role on the size of your on the size of your partition. If you if you you just start with the second one, then the size of partition is very small. So because our, basically what you're saying is the the whole graph is very structured. Yeah. I don't think I understand. It's just that the way that you stated the claim. I'm sorry. Then maybe this is just killing the point. No, no, no. But 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 I just wanted to say that like. 
the way the claim is stated, you're just saying there is a j such that for every function there is a j such that this is true. Right. I mean, like, if I just pick the last f of j minus j indices, yeah. then, then this will be true, right? Yeah, so you just pick the last indices. Yeah, so it seems true. like you'll always be outputting that. Like, you could always output that interval without loss of generality. Oh, I okay. I, I can see. So, so it's j is equal to l. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, that, that's, that's your point. So, um, um, how should I say that? Um, yeah, so, so that is always true. Um, but then I, okay, so, so in the proof, I, I want to use the smallest j possible. And then the smallest j uh, is going to be uh, related to your function f. And then, and then the function f, you iterate. So, one okay, of so, so, so the statement of the claim should be a little bit more. Yeah. Um, depending on, yeah, yeah, depending only on like the statement of the claim is just Right. Yeah, but, yeah. So, so for any f, is this what you're saying? Yeah. So, is this better? I understand. Okay. Can we do uh, like a couple of examples? If f of x equals x. Okay. If f of x equals to x, then what do you have for this interval? Is basically i one equals to one two, or one one one. And then i2 equals to 2. Right, so each one is just one lambda. Yeah. And what is the claim then? The claim is uh, for one of the, so you can, s the claim is you can find, um, you can find some interval, some ii, which this is smaller. So, so this is kind of true. There is some, some lambda that is smaller okay. than epsilon. Okay, so, so, okay, so for, for this, you kind of pick the extreme case. So maybe I choose a 1, 2, and then i2 is uh, maybe 3, 4. Uh, or something. Or you can you can pick a. Okay, so so this is uh, actually right. So you're just saying there is some i such that lambda i is smaller than epsilon to the three halves times n. Right. And this is true because we see over there that uh, lambda cannot all be large. That's right. Okay. okay. So what you can do for in that case you can uh, you can choose this like no, one over epsilon. For i large enough. I'm square. Yeah, you can you can do this, for example. So Dan, is it correct to say that for all f there exists j at most say one over epsilon q such that it, that summation is yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh okay, okay. Then it's <laughs> yeah. Right. So so and I agree. Yeah, so you eventually see the yeah, okay, so that that's what I maybe I should say that. So uh, j iterates f at most one over epsilon square times. Okay, so this this part comes here. Uh, yeah. right. The epsilon cannot have to do something beta, right? Because that one's telling me that the smallest eigenvalue is agnostic. Hmm? It's quite a bit I think it's always like this that epsilon is fixed and n is going to infinity. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. okay. So as I said, we can partition t into the three parts depending on the interval we chose. And then, so this part is the structured part. And, uh, and t2 is the, the part which the interval I picked. And then, <coughs> and then the t2, I call it, so, okay. so t2 is the small perturbation, the small part. And then the t3 is going to the, the pseudorandom part. Okay, so so they do they will make clear hopefully later when I when I do this. Okay, so now now, now let's first um, approximate t one. So for t one, okay. So for t one, okay. So how do we clean up t one? So eventually, I want to find an approximation of t basically, and then and then t partition into finite number parts. So how do we clean up t one? So so for each v, uh, for each i smaller than j, what we can do is we have those lambda i and we have the corresponding eigen, eigenvector ui. And, and, then the, and then ui has l1 norm to be 1. And uh, for the values of ui, uh, I can chop, okay, maybe I hope this is clear. So those are values from 0 to potentially infinity. And I chop them into intervals of uh, length. Uh, so this is a real line. This is a real line now. I chop them into intervals of size epsilon divided by j times 
uh, square root of m. So square root of n comes in the denominator. So each of the interval have size at most this one. And then I and I don't care after the interval have size. So I call the larger part if the size is at least uh, j divided by epsilon times one over square root of n. Okay. So so I'm just cutting the real line for now. So how many how many interval how many intervals I cut? So uh, into uh, so I, the number of intervals is at most. So the first part I have at most uh, square root of j divided by epsilon divided by epsilon times j plus one intervals because all these values are smaller than this. Ah, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, partition the VIs based on based on the vertex in UI, like where that lies in. So if uh, if Look in at a, one of the eigenvectors, right? So for one of the eigenvector UI, and I group them based on its value. So it's I. A, Yes, exactly. And you look at all the indices i, Such where u i, well, u as location i, is a uh, value up. close, close within you interval. To to exactly. So you're going to round up. You look at the vector u i. You yes. look at the coordinates, and you're going to round up the the values in u i, so into a bunch of values. intervals. And based on that, you're going to do yeah, do the partition, partition the exactly. Vertex. And you're going to do it to each of the vert the vectors in t one. Yes. And the partition will be all the refinements? All the refinement, yes. Right. So that's the idea. OK. Uh, let me write down so what. Maybe before you calculate the calculation, OK, just to understand what's the idea here. So you said that t1 would be the structured part. Right. So t1. Can you basically explain to us what, uh, how you get the structure? This is a low rank matrix. It only has a few vectors ui. Mm -hmm. So you look at this rectangular matrix right. of uis. And you round up all the values according to some uh, parameter. Yes. I don't know what is it, j square. Oh, uh, j is uh, so size, yeah. And based on that, you do. I do round up. Partition. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now what's? All right. So because lambda is a stru lambda is are bigger because it comes earlier on, so I can sort of imagine those those lambda i's tells me more structures about the global behaviors of the graph. So for each UI, I look as you said. I, I I round up, I round up each vertex U, uh, each vertex V, and I see which interval it belongs to, and I group those vertices based on which in interval they belong to. So for each UI, I have a partition of my vertex set into at most this many parts, and and then I know for each vertex set for each UI. The, the values um, of those vertices on this eigenvector is very close. Either they are very close to each other in, in that partition, in that part in the partition, or um, the value is large on that on that vertex. But then, because this is, is chosen, the value is chosen in such a way that the size of that big um, the the in the, because because UI is normalized, so the size of uh, these inter the vertices belong to this interval is small. Just by Markov chain, uh, Markov inequality. Okay, I hope I, I didn't lose any, like everyone. Um, maybe I did already. So it's a bit more uh, subtle than what I said. It's not only rounding; it's also the vertices, which are coordinates of these ve the vectors. Their coordinates are the vertices of the graph. So those coordinates or vertices that have very large value, you know, there are only few of them. Yes, that's right. Put them in like a general garbage. Yeah, I, I throw them into garbage. Okay. That's right. Yes. This allows you to bound the number of parts in your partition. Yes, that's right. Okay, in a way that maybe I didn't follow the calculation, but it's fine. Yeah, so you you see that idea how it goes. Yes. Yeah. Well. Yeah, so can, can you tell me again how, how you are partitioning the vertex? Okay, so UI is the eigenvector for for lambda i. So can, can you so so you can pick any basis for this uh, for this decomposition? Just no, 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 no. It's the eigenvector. Composition. It's unique for the graph. UIs are the eigenvectors. You don't mean to lambda i. Yeah, because I, I wrote T as in this way. Well, it's right. It's, it's a one of them, one of them. No, yeah. Can you just stick with unit, unit basis? 
Yeah, yeah they are orthogonal. They are orthonormal. Yeah, sure. So it's it's like okay. So so can you tell me how how you are grouping these vertices? Here? Right. Uh, so so on the real line, you partition those vertices. So either its value is larger than this on the indices. Well, so for the vector, each entry has a value. The problem is on the, uh, in your interval, in one of the examples, the, the interval consists of only one vector, u1. Okay? Okay. So then you look at this vector u1. Its coordinates are the vertices of the graph. So you have a vector like coordinates, that's where you say u1 is good. I don't hear you. What interval are you looking at? OK, let, let, me, let me draw. So for example, my ui, ui is a, is a, is a vector, one by one, right? So it's, it's uh, indexed by the, vec the, the vertices in the graph. So there are n rows. Yeah. So each row has a value, like a1, a2, all the way to an. Right. And then now I group all the ais of into intervals. OK, so suppose, um, OK, so I'll uh, give an example. Maybe it looks like uh, 0 0.01, 0 0.02, and then this one is like uh, 5, 3, 4, and this one is, like, I don't know, like 0 0.1. And then so what I do is if I put uh, vertex, so v1, I put vertex 1 and 2, because those values are kind of close. Uh, and, then, and then maybe I say, uh, those three values are close, so I put v2 equals to 3, and whatever those indices are, maybe they are 10, and then 21. Okay, but, but, but this partitioning might depend on the basis, right? Like yeah, for, 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 any, for any eigen decomposition, you, you find such one, yeah. The point is that uh, the, this basis, the ui, is a very special basis for this graph. It's, if the lambda are all distinct, it's a unique basis. It's why not some arbitrary why basis. Why is Ah. Because the sum of square is one. Uh, yeah, so if you square yeah. it times n is one. Right. Okay. So each eigenvector prescribes a partition and mm -hmm. and I do the common refinement of all the first j of them. Oh I see. If you've ever seen like the proof for Trigger's inequality, it tells you that the spectral uh, norm of the adjacency decompose the graph into the worst kind. It's also exactly looking at the, uh, the eigenvector, the second in that case, and using it to partition the graph into two parts. So it's very natural to look at eigenvectors and use them to partition the graph. It's, it's, yeah. You see it all over the place. Yeah, thank you. OK, um, so, uh, so for each, so basically, as a summary, so for each i smaller than j, I can partition the, the whole set G into uh, at most polynomial in J and epsilon parts, whereas we seen before J is independent from N, and then and then okay, and uh, and then the fluctuate and then except except the garbage part. So I throw this all these indices into garbage. Okay, <laughs> except the garbage. Um, o vertex uh, v uh, in that partish uh, in that part uh, differ little in uh, in vi. Okay, so so this is what I do, and then and I do the common refinement. for all i smaller than j. And so I keep on increasing the garbage set, and then the garbage is still small. How, how are you making sure that this is a partition? Because if you pick two, two, two vectors, u, u, u i and u j, um, like yeah, so same same like an upper in two different, uh, two different partitions, if you look at so that's why you do the common refinement because they, they might give you a different partition. Sorry? Okay. 
Okay, maybe. Yeah, maybe I should. Right. Okay. So, so, so I'm. Okay. Yeah. So okay. So the big or idea for th that's a good point. Um, so the idea is uh, so. So the T two and T three gives you very small fluctuations. Um, so the because uh, because for T three all the lambda i's are very small, and then for T two uh, the spectral norm is small. So that's why um, when you are partitioning t into these parts, basically what we can do, the approximation of uh, adjacent matrix t is you do the common refinement of, of t1, and, and, and then that gives you uh, approximation of t1 prime. And then for the rest of the parts, uh, if you compute e a and b, for the, for the other t2 and t3, they give you very little error term. And so the main term comes from can you say something about why you separate T2 from T3? Like uh, because for T3, I know each individual is small, but then for T2, each individual might still be big, but then the, the total sum is, is small. Uh, yeah, so for T2, um, I'm using the spectral norm to, to bound this. And I think for T2. What is your function? Oh, OK. So it depends on what regularity lemma you want to get. Uh, OK, so maybe let me, if, if, you, if you believe in me. And OK, so eventually what we'll get is for. So if you, if you do. So, so if you observe everything here by using spectral norm and then cauchy schwartz here for T3, this is what you'll get. And then so in, in order for to get the original Samaritis regularity lemma, what you need is, is this term is smaller than epsilon, uh, is little o epsilon v i v j. So that's why I have to grow tower type. And if you, <laughs> huh? OK, I, I, <laughs> I can write it down. So, no, don't write it down. OK, OK. Say something that makes right, so VIVJ VI, kind of, uh, so is kind of n divided by some polynomial in terms of j and epsilon. And then so you get some, uh, you, you get some behavior of f. And then for the j, so, so you get this one as a, as a function of j. But then for the j, you have to iterate f uh, this many times. Oh, so you okay. get, okay. yeah, okay. right. And then if you don't need uh, such a strong regularity lemma, if you just need a weak regularity lemma, you can simply just choose ff equals to i, uh, fi equals to i, then, then you get a better bound. Then you basically only get an expo, um, exponential, exponential function. Yeah, OK, so, so here is this proof. Um, so how, how does this last thing you apply the regularity? Oh, because this is just basically just counting the number of edges between a and b. And this is what you expect, and these are the error terms. Okay. So the error term is small, and th so that's exactly what the statement of the regularity lemma is saying. But I guess it's not exactly the statement, right? Because it's not clear to me at least that the partitions are roughly the same. Kind of oh, you can do the same trick as what I oh, do here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, let me. I don't think I have time for the. Removal lemma. Okay, let, let me let me say something about removal lemma. Maybe I'll continue for the last time. Yeah, you can say whatever you can. And then you can yeah. Okay, so regularity lemma uh, has lots of applications. I know one of is uh, maybe. You want to do yeah, it's important in counting. Um, um, so what do I mean? Maybe I should uh, say this first. So. By the regularity partition, so you can have the counting lemma. 
which basically says if you have, uh, so for example, for the triangle counting, triangle counting lemma is if I have three parts and each of them is absolute regular in between. Let me say, first of all, what is a counting? You have a graph, you want to count how many triangles they have. Right, exactly, yeah, thank you. So I want to count how many triangles there are in this graph. And then, and I give a simple example, suppose I have a, a tripartite graph where the edges only go across the different parts. And I want to count how many triangles in, in this graph, basically one vertex from each of the parts. And if I know between any two parts is epsilon regular, and the density, say, is at least two epsilon, for example, the density is epsilon, then the number of triangles is uh, roughly the size of, uh, is at least some constant times uh, d cube times n cube. So say if each of them is size n. So this is a counting lemma. So it basically says if I have a regular partition, then the number of uh, counts of the triangle is as, as if this is a random tripartite graph. I, I didn't write down the, the full statement. So it uses some definitions of the regularity parts. OK, so this, so this uh, counting lemma will with some other arguments will imply a very important applications of the regularity lemma, which is called the triangle removal lemma, which is called triangle removal lemma. It's started by uh, Ruza and Samaretti. <coughs> so what it says is um, if G on N vertices has little O N cube triangles, then we can remove middle and square edges to remove all the triangles. OK, so what exactly does that mean is for any, uh, for any epsilon, a real integer in 0 and 1, there exists a delta in 0 and 1 such that if G has, oh, there exists. So delta depends on epsilon. So if G has um, at most delta n cubed triangles, one can remove at most epsilon n square edges to remove all the triangles. And uh, the counterpositive part uh, of this is, which is easier to do the proof, is again for any epsilon there exists a delta such that if one cannot remove epsilon n square edges to get rid of uh, to kill all the triangles, then G has at least delta n square triangles. Uh, the other n cubed triangles. Okay, so I want to also make two remarks about this. So the first remark is um, so remark one. The normalization is important. Uh, normalization meaning is uh, is a normalization n cube. So this is because um, if G has um, so if G has at most, say, 0.1 n square triangles. Maybe you can give us some examples to show how this is not trivial. Um, some examples to show how this is not trivial. Uh, maybe after the remark I, I can say something. Okay, yeah. So, so, so here are two trivial remarks. So if G has at most 0.1 n square triangles, then by then I can remove, say, one edge from each of the triangles to kill all the triangles. Then can remove 0.1 n square edges to kill all triangles. Uh, sorry, maybe let me use to make it even more trivial, so 0.1 n triangles. So I only have linear number of triangles. Then I only need to remove linear number of edges to kill all the triangles. And this is definitely little n, n squared. 
So, so this, this problem is, is more interesting if my graph is relatively dense, in a sense that the number of triangles is of the correct order, n cube. Okay, so this is the first remark. The second remark is the triangle removal lemma is really a if and only if statement. So in a sense that the other direction is very easy to prove. Okay, so, so for the other direction is uh, if G, so we go to the other direction, if G, ha, uh, if G can be removed at most epsilon n square edges to kill all triangles, um, then how many triangles in, in G there are? are there, then G has at most epsilon n cube triangles because each triangle has to use one of the edges that is being killed. So I just multiply by n again. So this means... Each edge can only participate in n. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, each edge can participate in at most n triangles. So, so I get the other direction very easy. So this is really saying that this triangle removal lemma, it says... Um, G on n vertex has little o n cube triangle if and only if one can remove little o n square edges to kill all triangles. So one of the remarks that I've heard people say is that you might look at this statement and think it's pretty, it looks natural, it's probably pretty easy to prove. But when you, instead of little Surprised by the relationship between this epsilon and this tower of epsilon. Yes. So it already hides something from you. Exactly. Yeah. So as Eric mentioned, because this uh, this is um, application of the regularity lemma, and delta depends on epsilon. So so for we see for the other uh, direction, delta is basically just epsilon, but then for the deeper or the harder direction, which is the direction in described here, the delta dependence on epsilon, what we can prove is is tower in one, up, in one over epsilon, meaning like uh, one over delta is two to the two to the two, and is a height of uh, some function in terms of one over epsilon. So this is uh, this is this the bound comes directly from the proof of the regularity lemma. You can sharpen it by doing it as a log one over epsilon um, by using also methods similar to the regularity proof. But then, yeah, so, so this basically shows uh, this result is, is not very easy to, to prove because you, have, you get such a non-trivial bound. Um, it's less innocent than it looks. Exactly, yeah. So it looks like an um, um, average argument can prove this, but it's actually not. So, this is a, so the other direction is basically by using averaging argument, but then the other direction is, is very hard to prove. Um, so. Um, and then we will see maybe in next lecture what type of structures for bits a graph to be close to being triangle free is that you will have in, in the big graph G, you will be able to find small a blow up of a triangle in some sense that you have three constant size, a uh, constant fraction of vertices where <clears throat> the edges distributing a random like way. And then from that you will be able to count lots of triangles. But then I'll mention that uh, in the in the next in the next talk. Talk more about this in the next talk. Um, yeah, so there's a, right, so, so there's another remark I want to make. So the number of edges I want to remove from G is the L1 distance uh, uh, from G to be, <laughs> to be triangle free. So the triangle removal lemma is saying if the L1 distance of, from of G to be triangle-free is small, then the total counts of triangles is small. So it's really these two measures. And there's another measure to, to measure the, the distance of G, which is called the cut distance, which I'll mention next time. Um, um, so basically, a cut distance of a graph is um, of two graphs, G1 and G2. is the supreme, supreme of all the vertex set u prime inside B. So suppose G1 and G2 rely on the same vertex set, and this, and this is the, um, the discrepancy uh, 
of edges between G1 and G2. Oh, maybe let me write this. So this is E uh, G1 restricting to E V prime and then the difference with G2. OK. So it, it looks less natural from, from this one, but then by using the cut norm, you can, you can get the weak regular dilemma, as I mentioned before uh, earlier, which you have better bounds. So wh why this is a weaker one? Because the cut norm is small implies that the total number of, tries of, number of uh, triangles is small. So that is a much easier, um, that's a much easier proof. So the harder one is actually the L1 distance. So because L1 distance is much more sensitive compared to the cut distance. And for the L1 distance, it's much harder. So I'll, I'll talk more about removal lemma for, from like, uh, next lecture. So, so can you repeat what removal lemma you get for the cut distance? Oh, it's, it's the same. So if you can, if you can remove, um, so if uh, G1 is uh, within cut norm epsilon uh -huh. from triangle free, then G has very small number of triangles. Okay. So that's basically what is the counting lemma is doing. Yeah. So to summarize again, the L1 distance is the one we talked about in the removal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And the cut norm is a weaker kind of distance. Right. Which allows you to prove better quantitative bounds. Quantitative bounds for the number of triangles. Yes, that's right. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. That's all. all. Right, so next week you'll tell us more about. Yeah. Everything. All yeah. right. Thank you very much.